I love this part. All right. <laughs> and we all might find ourselves just to make a low light. This being Still album six, I had to kind of go back to the way I felt on album one, light. which is that there's no expectations except the expectation. Goosebumps of not playing by any rule but Ultimately, I think this record is, is a really hopeful one. All the echoes just seem to be a good phrase to represent, throwing away the rule book a little bit. This album turned out way beyond what I was expecting and beyond what I was hoping for. You don't realize sometimes that you've been dreaming too small until you see what, what has been possible all along, you know? Hello. Josh here on day 36 of the recording process. The best studio experiences for me are the times when we mixed all the ingredients and blew things up, and we're just, we're just leaving every day completely spent with our hair in every direction. That's... That to me is my outlet. <laughs> I know, me too. They could sing all the wrong notes, and I would still that sound it was absolutely majestic. Ultimately, when you when you finish a record, the the thing that you want people to take away from it is hopefully they can get a slice of the feeling you had. Look at the look at this look at this, look at this room. genius look at room. This guys. room of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed uh, wunderkinds. <laughs> <laughs> this record for me was such a, a joy from beginning to end to to complete. We had so much fun. A great live energy from beginning to end. Kind of a, a lesson in being able to have fun and do good work too. And the whole idea of suffering for your art, I guess, kind of went out the window this time around. Tog Salter and I were starting the beginning of the song, and I was just kind of messing around with it and just kind of doing that doom, gung, dung, gung, 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 gung. And I'm just, he's like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, yeah, that is kind of cool. What is that, you know? And then the first thing that popped out of my mouth was, wake up, wake up, blah, 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 blah. I don't know, just something that said it was a, a wake up, wake up kind of thing. I had no idea what the song would mean. Wake up, wake up, the sun cannot wait for long. Reach out, reach out before it fades away. Rob Cavallo brought whole kind of talent to my world. Rob likes to work the way I like to work, which is we get everybody in the same room and we let the musicians balance off of each other. I really wanted the musicians to cut into the songs. I wanted them to really kind of fight for their sound. starts that's kind of what I was doing on the synth and then that was very much what my fingers were doing they're kind of matching that and then the strings I'm talking about digging into the strings so they 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 were playing off of what the band was doing, and so they were really basically fighting to be heard, and it came across as very large. I love when you hear the guitar and the orchestra together. Getting those background vocals in there. That wasn't planned. That was another thing I just, we heard in our heads as being like a real hook. And so then when we started doing the arrangement of the vocals, these singers. Almost an African thing, you know?
lot of the times we had, in one half of the room, we had kind of the rock group. We would have the drummer and the, the electric guitar and the bass. On the other side of the room, we would have kind of the, the string players and the harpist, you know, and they'd come in with a very, they'd be practicing brahms and whatever coming in. And it was so cool to see their dynamic off of each other because you take one of them away. Some days we would have just one section come in and we'd say, oh, we'll put the strings in later. You sing in the hall and after those. It was almost like too yeah, edgy. It was sure. too, almost like a self-indulgent rock kind of day in the studio where we'd kind of listen to it and we'd go, yeah, yeah, man, yeah, that's a good day. But something was missing. There was a pathos, there was a balance that wasn't there. What wound up happening when we had everybody there together was that the kind of rock and pop musicians would bring out an energy and a swing to the cl classical players. And the, the classical players brought out kind of a, a balanced musicality and a subtlety to a rock drum kit or an electric guitar. And it became less about the thrashing of chords and the crashing of cymbals and more about how do we make an electric guitar sound like a band? You know, how do we you know, take a mallet to the, to the cymbals as opposed to a wooden stick? I see the same, the same passion, the same emotion, whether it's Robert Plant singing a, a high note or Pavarotti singing a high note. There's the same demons at play. There's the same emotions at play. Falling Slowly, I first, I first heard, I think maybe five years ago or so, when the movie came out, um, the Glenn Hansard you know, uh, version of it. I've always loved the song. It was just, to me, it was just a guilty pleasure. I just thought the song is one of the best songs I've ever been written. Basically, it's just a matter of when's the right time to sing it. I don't know you. Always assuming we would keep it as a duet. You realize that it doesn't have to be two people singing to each other like they do in the movie. That's their take on it, kind of a solitary romantic experience, I guess. Never start with a title. It's always so difficult to um, to find a word or a phrase that can accurately describe what you've gone through for a year of blood, sweat, and tears. So, so what we did was we started with lyrics. We just started looking through lyrics and uh, trying to find words that popped out at us that just felt right. Sometimes that's the lyrical process too. Of just a word just sounds right. And we were listening to this song "Hollow Talk," and we saw the word "echoes." And as I'm reading through the black and white lyrics, that word just kind of flashed out. My very good friend, Dion Singer, at uh, Warner Brothers Records, uh, he sent this song, he kind of had his finger on the pulse of this song in Scandinavia. Whenever I travel around, I, I really am always fascinated with what makes people tick in other countries, what the, what the hot rock song is, or the, even the top 40. You know, I, if I go to France, or if I go to Norway, a lot of times it becomes like a huge guilty pleasure to just see like what's what's the big thing over there. It starts very controlled and it ends very controlled, but the middle of the song is is very primal. And uh, Rob and I kind of said, you know, what if we're both getting kind of the same visual? Why don't we? We've never done this before. But why don't we add a little, you know, sound effect? You know. So we went on Sunset Boulevard, and it was very late at night, and we just went out there and just kind of recorded the lonely street noise. And so that's kind of what, what starts the track. It just kind of, for whatever reason, it told an interesting story. It was almost like a nice, it became one of the instruments. Echo start is a crossing Trembling noises that come to not the most fun day for a piano player. <laughs> Did you cry? No, that was our, our guy Jamie. <laughs> that was the one time where I'm just like, you take it, you got this. The stuff he played was all just his own his own part. And these strings. This is the kind of stuff that they did uh, just improvisationally. We would have them come in, almost without even needing to have anything written down. They would come in and they would just, you know, and then we'd just go into the bow. And they would just start 
they immediately knew kind of what the mood of the song was. And, the and that's kind of an example of, you'll hear it too in the middle of the song. You got the guys kind of, you know, they might have played even harder if those strings weren't there to kind of take them, take them to a softer spot, you know, so it stayed very intimate. Back to the beginning. The vocal on it is uh, I one take. I got tricked into doing final vocals on this record. That's that's the the secret brilliance of Rob Cavallo too is, is that as a singer who's very much a control freak uh, and tr trying to be a perfectionist, I was always assuming when I was singing with the band, or with, you know, well I'll just go back, I'll go in, I'll go in, and we can hash this out, I'll go in and really do my. Sorry guys. It, didn't get a lot of sleep last night or, you know, had a frog in my throat. It's gonna be, you guys, you guys sound great. You guys sound awesome. I'm gonna come back in next week and I would kind of, you know, think in my own mind, these are this is, this is just, I'm just gonna have the best time trying to interpret this with the musicians that I have with me here today. And then my control freak side is gonna go in and do the vocals next week and really nail it down. And the most amazing thing happened, which is that when I put myself in that mentality, we actually got our final vocals. Holy cow, that's amazing. Okay. <laughs> Word okay. absolutely perfect. Let's do one more all the way through, and if you get the same notes wrong, we'll, we'll punch. Yeah, okay. fantastic job, man. Cool, thanks. It's done. <laughs> I think it's done. And Rob said, these are the moments I want. These are, this is the ebb and flow of you and the musicians. And then even when I was even more stubborn and said, oh, oh, oh but wait. Are there any lines that we could try some note variations? or? Uh... I'll show you. I'll show you what a real vocal sounds like. Sure, why not? <laughs> okay. I couldn't beat it. Abe Laborial Jr. on drums, just who's just a monster. in the studio. Something's leaking. <laughs> that Irish pipe is so cool. Eric Rigler was in the studio to put pipes on She Moves to the Fair, another song on the album. And we just thought there was be a really cool to have. I love when when pipers play on top of rock music. A lot of times what fans don't realize is that when, when an album takes forever, it's not because you're sitting at the board spending two months on a violin part. It's because you're you're trying to find the diamond in the rough from a song perspective. There aren't a lot of great songs out there, believe it or not. There's a lot being written. So so when something like that comes knocking at your door and it winds up shaping so beautifully, that's, you know, Merry Christmas. It's fantastic. I went to a school that was very sports-centric, you know, and I was playing a lot of sports and kind of singing quietly to myself at home. My parents were amazing in that they, growing up in Los Angeles, they took my brother and I to lots of shows. So I would go to, I would see, youth classical concerts, I would see Elton John at the Hollywood Bowl, Cirque du Soleil, whatever. They just took us to stuff that inspired us. And I got the bug very early on. I just wanted to, I didn't just want to hum the songs on the way to the car and then forget it and go back to school. I wanted to keep it in my world. There was something about how I felt in that auditorium that I wanted to, I wanted to keep with me. And I realized that that feeling was so special to me that it wasn't just about continuing to be a fan. It was that I wanted to make people feel that way. I love music. I, I, at times when I felt like I wasn't good at anything else, I could always hear a song and then go to the piano and play it immediately. I learned how to play by ear from my dad. Um, it was just something I always had. It took me forever and ever and ever to learn how to read music, but, but I could always play stuff right off the bat. What we're gonna do here, folks, is we're gonna stop on leave at 44. We had a really amazing choir arranger named Roger Treese who came in and he's done a lot of amazing work with Bobby McFerrin and with all sorts of different people and he's, he's great and he's kind, of, he's kind of sick in the best possible way, like he'll come in, just him, and the way he kind of describes how he's going to arrange the part is 
he looks like a madman. You know, he'd be like, I'm gonna go, and I'm a and it was like, like, you're absolutely out of your mind. And he'd be like, no, trust me, that's gonna be great. And then he'll, he'll, you know, play for us what they did there. And he'd be like, yeah, you know, that's the part. Hey, hey, that's, that's the thing, you know? And uh, so we, we realized very quickly that he was a mad genius. And uh, it was really fun to see his interpretation uh, on some of these songs. Choir day. This time I believe. I believe When I Fall in Love is the second Stevie Wonder song I've sung in my life. I, the first one was They Won't Go and I Go. The great thing about Stevie Wonder's music is that he writes classic, classic melodies. He almost writes arias. I mean, the songs that he writes are, are stunningly, classically beautiful. And so I think the reason why I was drawn to that song was A, from a, a lyrical standpoint, where I like the love songs that kind of are about the gray area and the baggage and all the stuff that goes horribly wrong. And then the chorus almost changes, you know, changes gears completely and goes into this very soulful, very positive sounding melody and lyric, of course, which is that, ah, but the next time, the next time I fall in love, yeah, all that stuff sucked. I was half a man, I was a shell of a human being. But when I come back, you know, now I know what I want. Now, I, now I'm smart enough to realize when it comes my way, I'm gonna hold on to it. And that's how the big crash bang boom at the end of the record. Started with just a microphone. Was our what would we do live to get people standing? That's what we wanted to do for the end of the record. Drums were a big part of this record. A lot of that is because I love them. Rob comes from a rock background, and, and when you've got guys like Abe uh, in there, why not? My parents got me a kit when I was maybe 16. I just was fascinated with them. I was reading all the magazines, but I'd never played any. So I just, I kind of played around a little at school and really, really wanted to learn. So they got me a kit and I just would listen to CDs and just taught myself. So it was, it was just always one of those things that was just a hobby. It still is, but it's a fun one. As a real fan of rhythm and drums, um, I'm, I'm also self-aware enough to know when it's right to bow out and let the greats do their thing. You know, I like to be able to Explore some of the things that I've learned in my life and in love. Coffee's on the table and I Sometimes uh, in relationships, often in relationships, sadly, just can't see you can get very comfortable in the discomfort. One more day it's not so much about not being able to get over someone, it's about having the courage to say to yourself, I can do it. No, I'm good for waiting, but waiting wasted. This started uh, as a demo that I wrote with Togs Salter um, at Westlake Audio in Hollywood. It kind of started with a riff. We were just kind of playing a little bit of an out-of-tune piano. This one sounds much better. But it kind of started with that. And he started miming what I was doing on, on the piano on his guitar. And sometimes when you're writing a piano part like that, the, the temptation is to kind of 
write a line that's very similar to the piano part, which is, you know, to kind of go. And I know that I am than I am. It's like, no, it's just, you gotta let the piano part do its thing. So this is me playing piano in the studio with Tim Pierce on guitar. But this right here is basically what Togs and I did in the studio four years ago. And then, you know, when you get everybody else involved. Oh, I, I don't take it lightly. The trouble that I've gone through to get you to know I am. Oh, I, I can't find a reason to be happy in this heartache. Cause I should know better than that. But I can't. The cool thing about how sometimes arrangements come together based on stuff that happens very spontaneously in the studio. So David Campbell, who arranged this, was just like, what's, what's that guitar part there? So... And then back to whatever the arrangement is. But for that moment, you know, the spontaneous moment in the guitar just turned into you know, really nice back and forth between the, the guitar and the strings. Oh, I, I can't find a reason to be happy in my heartache Cause I should know better than that It's a bit of a sad song that disguises a happy song Which is the way those relationships are It's a sad kind of rumblings underneath A really happy-go-lucky exterior It's the most country I've ever gone with this song This, this album is honestly here. better than we could have so dreamed. Excited. I think when my fans listen to my album, it's because um, it's for a number of reasons, but hopefully they can also False get alarms. a little uh, sense of who I am and what makes me tick. And <laughs> I remember when I first started at 17 or 18, and I would find myself in an orchestra room or a studio like this, and I just wanted to curl up in a ball in the corner. I, just, I was just overwhelmed with this I'm not worthy attitude. I never stop being nervous playing with these guys because they're just, they're that good. Oh, it's good. I will always, to a certain degree, feel like that kid in seventh grade who was going to step out for the first time and sing. If I could go back and talk to that kid, you know, I would try and get him to relax a little more, just to enjoy the ride a little bit more. I mean, it's been an incredible one. You did an awesome job for a first time. That's my first time. So. There were a hundred things that could have happened that, that could have kept me from sitting here right now. And so I think that when everybody else was partying and, you know, kind of enjoying the moment a little too much, I had a really hard time patting myself on the back, and I think that ultimately was a good survival mechanism for me. Because of the nature of the, the making of this record, and because we just kind of dove in every day, not knowing what to expect and just letting it flow, we actually wound up recording very, very quickly. And I think I've recorded some of the best stuff that I've ever done. So, um, so I learned that I could, I could actually have a lot of fun and enjoy the ride and make music from the gut and trust your instincts, and you can still Make a bloody bit of I believe what I've fallen in love with you will be forever. 